Coming up now on Animal Outtakes, when you visit animals here, you're actually helping animals in the wild too. We're visiting Naples Zoo and learning more about the conservation programs that they have in place. Jellies can sting, and if it happens to you, do you know the best remedy? Our Inspector Planet is putting the common theories to the test. And if your pet is lost or stolen, this is one of the most effective ways to protect them. This and much more straight ahead on Animal Outtakes. Zoos aren't just a place for the public to look at animals. Many zoos allow scientists the chance to study animal species and even work at conservation efforts towards those animal species that are threatened or endangered. The Naples Zoo in Florida is a place that does just that. The staff and volunteers focus on ways to protect and preserve the animals there, all while making a lasting impression on the guests. A hundred years ago, this land in Naples, Florida was purchased by a botanist to protect his collection of plants. Fifty years ago, new landowners used the lush tropical landscape for another collection, exotic animals. This land then became Naples Zoo. The Tetzloff family brought animals and we were able to carefully place the animal exhibits within this historic garden with only removing one single pine tree, which is really fantastic. So we were able to preserve the beauty of this property and add animal. And it's home to more than 70 animal species, all surrounded by beautiful gardens. Being able to come to zoos and see all these different um, exotic and even native species is really important because you do get to build that really close connection with them um, and really learn why all these different animals are important from you know, insects to snakes to lions. You know, getting to know why these animals are so important and building that personal connection really helps um, you know, people relate to them and understand why we need to help them out um, and really help us help the uh, public join that mission of ours to help save species all over the world. The glass window at the African lion habitat allows guests to get up close and really connect visitors with these big cats. We have our two African lions. Uh, we have a male and a female. Our male is Masamba, he is 10 years old, and our female Shawnee is 13 years old. Yeah, their personalities um, are actually pretty different. Masamba is a little bit more laid back than Shawnee. Masamba kind of when I work with him, he really does remind me of my cat at home because he likes to rub his face against, um, you know, the fence and he really seems like he's just really into it and he is very vocal, he talks a lot. So, um, you know, it's, it's really cool to get to work up close with them and see those different personality differences with them. Female lions are the ones that go out and hunt for food while the male's job is to protect the pride. They are strict carnivores, um, so in the wild they hunt for different types of, you know, like gazelle and um, hoofstock animals and things like that. Here at the zoo, um, we do feed them all meat. Along with uh, getting the meat diet, we also feed them every uh, Thursday, so once a week they get a bone day. So they get a bone every week, um, and that gives them those extra vitamins and nutrients that are in the marrow and, you know, help kind of clean their teeth, kind of like your dog or cat at home. Masamba and Shawnee are part of a program developed by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or AZA, to protect species that are threatened or endangered. Um, a breeding program called a Species Survival Plan. So they were paired together based on their genetics um, to hopefully reproduce. We haven't had any cubs here at the zoo, but um, we're kind of holding out for hopefully having some here in the future. Another animal that's in the breeding program are these. Giraffe are the most amazing species on the planet. They are the tallest land animals in the world. Um, they're about, about 18 and 19 feet tall. Our giraffe in this exhibit are about 16 to 18 feet tall. Um, the females are a bit smaller. They're about 15 to 16 feet tall. And when a baby giraffe is first born, they are already six feet tall and 150 pounds. 
So their tongue is prehensile, so in the wild, they're going to use their tongue to wrap it around branches of a tree, and then they're able to pull those branches into their mouth, and then um, they don't have any teeth on their upper jaw in front, so they clamp onto the branch and they're able to strip all the leaves off in one long fluid swipe. And they're going to eat in the wild 18, 19 hours a day. So in zoos, um, we give them a lot of browse, which is their branches from the trees, um, but we can't give them as much as they would obviously have in the wild, so we supplement their food with grain, uh, a special grain that's, that's designed for uh, uh, wild um, browsers like giraffe and they also get ac acacia uh, as part of one of their favorite browse and they also get um, alfalfa hay and produce for training but they eat I mean we estimate it it's not exact we estimate they eat probably around 50 pounds per animal per day the biggest comment I ever hear is like oh I didn't know their heads were so big because even at other facilities when you feed a giraffe and you're on head level it's like you don't really get the appreciation of how big they are so down here where the giraffe bend down to to feed from the from the people like kids are just amazed at how big they really are and especially like when their huge head is right there and then they stick out their long 18 you know 16 inch long tongue to grab a hold of that food and pull it into their mouth kids are just amazed all the time about just how beautiful they are and and uh, just how huge they are visiting an aza certified facility helps keep the species survival program going so future generations can enjoy these unique animals so we have a, um, a stud book coordinator who keeps track of all the genetics of giraffe in zoos and then they're able to say um, which giraffe should breed with another giraffe to keep the population genetically uh, stable. So we want to be able to say in a hundred years if something happens to giraffe in the wild we want to be able to use giraffe in zoos to then repopulate the wild. So in order to do that we have to make sure that our genetics within zoos are, you know, broad enough in order so that we are able to um, repopulate the wild. It wouldn't be, you know, a bunch of inbreeding or anything like that. We want, we want the draft to be as little related to each other as possible. So we do that with all, almost just most of the animals in zoos are part of the species survival plan. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Naples Zoo Primate Expedition Crew, sponsored by the Florida Everblades Hockey Team. And once again, these are Siaman Gibbons. Siaman gibbons are native to Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Sumatra. They are the largest of the lesser apes, weighing as much as 30 pounds. They're very muscular. Underneath their chin, there is a large flap of skin. This is a guller sack. If they want to, they can inflate that sack with air and emit a very loud territorial call that can be heard up to two miles away. One thing that contributes to a love connection and a successful breeding pair, the environment. And for the primates at Naples Zoo, their habitat is top notch. <laughs> there are nine islands on this lake with about 16 different primates. There are no bars, no fences, but the water acts as a natural barrier. So over on the left hand side, we have both a monkey and a gibbon, two different species, but they get along very well. The monkey is gray in color with black fur on her face. She is a gray langur monkey. The gibbon is black in color with blonde fur on his face. He is a buff-cheeked gibbon. The easiest way to tell the difference between a monkey and an ape just by looking at them is that monkeys have tails and apes do not. Visitors take a boat tour around the different islands, able to observe these primates as if they were in the wild. Keepers use enrichment to engage, allowing these primates to work a little for their food. Black-handed spider monkeys are New World monkeys, meaning they are native to the Americas. They do have a prehensile tail. It's like having a third hand. Anything they can do with their hand, they can do with their tail, including peeling a banana. And their tail does have a tactile pad that allows them to grab things. Black-handed spider monkeys are very important to the ecosystem as they are what is known as a seed dispersal agent. They eat fruit. It quickly passes through their system. And when they void, they leave the seeds behind in a little package of monkey fertilizer. Preparing and thinking ahead to the future is an important step in making sure that these animals are around for future generations to enjoy. The Naples Zoo wants these animals and visitors to come back for another 50 years. And getting an interaction like this will hopefully leave a lasting impression of admiration and preservation. There are many steps we can all take to help conserve wildlife populations. The Naples Zoo has some examples on their website, like creating a wildlife habitat in your own backyard, or even making sure your coffee is bird friendly helps protect migratory birds. We can all make a difference. Visit their website to find out more ways you can help. Picture this. 
you're swimming in the ocean, and then ouch, you're stung by a jelly. Dr. Tracy is testing the most common sting remedies to see which ones work at relieving the pain. That's coming up next. Over 90% of the seafood that is coming in to this country is raised in areas of the world that don't have the highest standards. And so our approaches are aimed for two things. One is to help feed the world. The second is to do it in an environmentally friendly and sustainable way. Every dog deserves a lifelong loving home. Dante's Den provides a pristine, comfortable haven for dogs that have been abandoned or surrendered by their owners. We ensure that every pup in our Joyful Dogs Adoption Program receives lots of love and attention, is properly immunized, spayed or neutered, and is in good health. Prospective pet parents undergo a thorough adoption review to ensure a lifetime of love and care. Find your new furry best friend at Dante's Den. For more information, go to dantesden.org or call 844-DANTES-DEN. Dante's Den, continuing the love. Science is everywhere and it's all around us. It's observing the world, forming questions, and the willingness to find the answers. It's something our Inspector Planet does every day, and you can too. Hi, my name is Dr. Tracy Panara. I'm an environmental engineer, which means that I use different scientific disciplines to protect the environment, humans, and wildlife. At Mo Marine Laboratory, I use investigation and myth busting to answer questions. They are beautiful, aren't they? Oh, they're gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous, but they're a little bit dangerous, too. They are. They've made it through 60 million years. 95% water, just this fragile gelatin structure. They've made it through because of their defense mechanisms, their tentacles and their ability to release toxin. But I know that there is a natural way that we can take care of this. A lot of people think that. I think it calls for an investigation. All right, let's do it. Experiment time. What is the most interesting thing about jellyfish? So jellyfish don't have brains, but they've been living for over 650 million years. So they should have went to the Wizard of Oz. They should have. So can you tell me a little bit about the differences between species and their venom? So jellyfish, all species, have different amounts of venom. So the sting of the moon jellyfish, which are right behind us here, are different than, say, a sea nettle or an upside down jellyfish, or even our Portuguese man of war, which we've heard are pretty bad. And so each jellyfish has a different set of venom in which to catch different prey. So like these moon jellyfish don't have a real potent sting at all. So they actually will grab very small critters and very small chemicals out of the waters. So we're going to test some remedies for jellyfish stings. What we have here is some upside down jellyfish. They're not the typical jellyfish that you see with the really long tentacles. Instead, they release the toxin into a mucus layer into the water. Now we know that they don't have brains. How they release that venom is biomechanically from any kind of mechanical or chemical stimulus. We're going to test the pH, the salinity, among other chemical parameters. And then we're going to test it against some typical remedies that you hear about all the time. Urine, meat rub, and white vinegar. So uh, let's get started. Interns, bathroom. So what we're going to do, I added some fresh water in here to try to change that osmotic pressure. I'm also going to try to mechanically stimulate that venom release by mixing them up and making them not happy, basically. All right, 
So let's do this test. So first we're going to test the pH. And the reason why we're going to do that is to show that the jellyfish venom is slightly alkaline, meaning that it's more basic than acidic. So we want a remedy that will be more acidic than basic to neutralize that sting. Next, we're gonna test the pH of vinegar, which, uh, well, we know that vinegar is an acid. Next, the meat rub, where one of my scientists swears by meat rub as a remedy for jellyfish stings. We're also going to test the salinity when it comes to urine. And that's because we know that adding fresh water changes that osmotic pressure and causes those nematocysts to release. And that can happen even after the tentacle is disengaged from the jellyfish body. So let's test that. So looking at the pH alone, we see why urine isn't the best solution. Now we see that for Chloe and Willie, their pH was slightly basic, close to neutral though. And we saw for, for Shannon that her pH is around a six, which is only slightly acidic. So if we were going to use somebody's urine for a jellyfish sting, Shannon gets the win. <laughs> But we saw from our probe analysis that in fact that we didn't have the salinity that we would want. Throwing your pee on your jellyfish sting would cause those nematocytes to keep on releasing that venom. It is a bad idea. At best, it does absolutely nothing for your jellyfish sting. So let's look at our other options. First, the meat rub. Well, that scientist here at Moat that uses meat rub for jellyfish stings, he's on to something because it's actually acidic and can potentially neutralize that jellyfish sting. And our last is vinegar. And the great thing about vinegar is that it's really acidic, which we knew coming in. So we knew that that was going to be probably our most viable option, our most viable remedy for a jellyfish sting. In addition, Vinegar has proved to disengage those nematocytes from firing their venom. So when you get stung by a jellyfish, the first thing that you wanna do is use that vinegar. Even before you try to get those tentacles off, you wanna make sure that those tentacles can't release that venom when you're mechanically taking those tentacles off. You don't wanna use fresh water because that can potentially, as we said before, increase the amount of venom released. So remember guys, anyone could be a scientist or an engineer with some passion, hard work, and innate curiosity of how the world works. Hi, it's Planet. Hi, Bob and Tracy. What is the biggest animal on Earth? Well, the biggest animal that is living right now on Earth is the blue whale. In fact, the blue whale is also the largest animal that has ever existed. Blue whales can be found in all the world's oceans, except for the Arctic. So how big is a blue whale? Well, they can be about the size of this 100-foot boat. Their heart alone is the size of a small car. But despite their humongous size, they have no teeth. Instead, they have baleen. It's kind of like a fibrous material that helps filter their food. What do they suck up? Well, small crustaceans called krill. Hi, Dr. Tracy, my name is Kenley, and how many seahorse babies can a seahorse have at once? Hey, Kenley. Seahorses are such remarkable species. Did you know that it's actually the male seahorse that carries the babies? Depending on the species, these Mr. Moms can give birth to more than a thousand babies at a time. You may assume that this means that there would be lots of little baby seahorses, right? But fry are so tiny that most don't survive to adulthood. Out of a thousand babies, maybe only about a handful will make it in the wild. Animal Outtakes will be right back.
Outtakes is produced by Dante's Den Foundation, a nonprofit group dedicated to creating the best life for dogs. If you would like to learn more about Dante's Den, donate or volunteer, visit our website, dantesden.org. For a pet owner, one of the most scary thoughts is your pet getting lost or stolen. But there is an effective way of protecting your dog or cat. It's called a microchip. It's basically like a tiny computer that stays with your animal, even if they don't stick around. Microchipping, Dr. Glassman, we believe in it. It, to us, is imperative. Mm -hmm. Does it hurt when they put it in? And <laughs> <laughs> you know me with needles. And uh, why should we really, really do this? Yeah, microchipping is a great way, of course, to identify your pet if it gets lost. Uh, does it hurt? Eh, it's a modest-sized needle, but it takes literally about a second if the technician or the veterinarian you know, gets it in properly, quick, you just inject, it comes in. There's, there's literally about 20, at least 22 companies that make these, so it gets a little complicated sometimes scanning the pet, uh, but various little devices. This is a little injector here, and uh, you just pop it under the skin between the shoulder blades and that's a permanent now marker. It's not a GPS. Some people think, oh, this is a GPS <laughs> device and we can track our pet. It doesn't work like that. It's literally only the size of a rice grain and it's got a code that can be read with a scanner and there's literally many, many types of scanners and often shelters and veterinarians have to have more than one type of scanner because there's so many companies so you don't miss scanning you know, the chip. Um, but uh, like Raja here is chipped and it's easy to find. You just engage with the scanner and you go around and it comes up with a number if mm -hmm. you've got the right scanner right. for that chip. And then if you find a pet, well, if you find a pet lost, take it to your vet or a shelter. Hopefully they can scan it easily, get the number. And then there's a few companies with 800 numbers they can call and say, okay, this is the number. You know, then who owns this pet? Because when you get microchipped, your pet gets microchipped, you'll have instructions to contact the company so you register the pet in your name and they all have a unique number, of course. That's right, and we give you the um, barcoded number and you call the local company that uh, it might go to, Home Alone, Pet Link, or yeah, some there's of, tons there's of them. tons of them. Mm -hmm. And then you give them the number. You will right. have a copy of the number right. and they will have a copy of the number and then your pet gets returned. Right, so you'll have a number, the, the client will have their uh, unique number, the veterinarian who did it will have the unique number, so even if you lose yours, you contact your veterinarian, they should be able to look up the records. Um, now again, it's not a GPS, global positioning system where you can find your pet. You can buy those systems, they're big collars, because you have to have a battery operated transmitter that can transmit to the, uh, the satellite in the sky or some other types of receivers. I don't know how they all work, but you can get uh, collars se separate from this that you can track your pet with. And there's all kinds of ranges of prices and different services they offer from what I understand. I've never used one myself, but the microchip again is only the size of a rice grain and a scanner can find it very quickly and easily and you can get your pet returned. So you, you highly recommend Oh yeah, this. all of my pets are done. Well, you know, Raja's microchip comes back to Dante's den. So we're stuck with each other. Mm -hmm. Stay with us. More Animal Outtakes is coming up next. Every dog deserves a lifelong loving home. Dante's Den provides a pristine, comfortable haven for dogs that have been abandoned or surrendered by their owners. We ensure that every pup in our Joyful Dogs Adoption Program receives lots of love and attention, is properly immunized, spayed or neutered, and is in good health. Prospective pet parents undergo a thorough adoption review to ensure a lifetime of love and care. Find your new furry best friend at Dante's Den. For more information, go to dantesden.org or call 844-DANTES-DEN. Dante's Den, continuing the love.
We hope you had fun and learned a thing or two along the way. We'll be back here again next week with even more animals and some wild adventures. Until then, thanks for watching. This week on Animal Outtakes, jellies can sting. Dingy. <laughs> Zoos aren't just a place for... <laughs> okay. Never thought I would get a PhD to do this. Oh, <laughs> that could have been bad. <laughs> There's a bunch of bad things happening. Uh... <laughs>